The following was recorded in front of a live studio audience at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. This is the United Podcast Network. The following program is closed captioned for the thinking impaired. By tomorrow, I will rule the world! <laughs> He's gone? He's not gone! That's the whole point! He's never gone! Is this some radical new therapy? You see? <laughs> well, I must have not been paying attention when you were just talking to me. Do you think that you could repeat the question? And I listen more attentively. There must have been. Alrighty. And I must have missed something when you were just talking to me. Alrighty. Let's get this show on the road, shall we? Hi, how you guys doing? My name's Tom Duggan here with the Paying Attention Podcast. Hi, top two guys smoke shop at the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe. Normally at the beginning of the month, the first Tuesday of the month, we have Methuen Mayor Neil Perry in with us for the Methuen Mayor Neil Perry Report. And uh, he's not with us today. He's uh, under the weather. He's not feeling very well. Um, so we tried to get him for next week, except next week, Ben, we can't have him here next week. Next week, we've got a really special show. We're, gonna, we're probably going to go over. In fact, I'm telling you right now, we're definitely going to go over next week. Next week, and I, 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 I toyed with the idea of not announcing this until the day before, because you know we're going to have problems. But next week, I've got... Um, we're going to do our Cops Lives Matter show. We're going to have Methuen Police Chief Joe Solomon here, Lawrence Police Chief Roy Vask will be here, and North Andover Police Chief Chuck Gray will be here. Now, normally these three guys come in with Boxford Police Chief Jim Ryder at, in the last week of December. Normally they come in the last week of December and we talk about like police stuff. Right, So every year for the last three years we've had them in, it's been kind of like a staple because our very first show, that's who we had on. And we talked about police stuff. And by the way, if you go back and watch our very first show, we talked about some of this Black Lives Matter stuff three and, three and a half years ago. And um, with all of the anti-police hysteria and all the racial hysteria that's going on in this country, I thought, why wait until December? Let's have these guys on now to try and address what's going on uh, with Black Lives Matter across the country, uh, the morale of the police, and what these guys think. And... Um, you know, we had, um, with all this Black Lives Matter, police hatred, hatred for white people, hatred for America, uh, the hysteria that's running through our streets where people are pulling down statues, pulling down monuments, defacing monuments. Um, I thought it was a good idea to have these guys in. So that'll, that'll be a pretty interesting show. One of the things I'm going to talk to um, Methuen Methuen Chief Joe Solomon about is something that happened within the last couple of weeks. So with all of this Black Lives Matter stuff, which that really, by the way, doesn't mean Black Lives Matter. Like nothing is what it's called, you know. Like they could they, in Florida. I remember like ten years ago they had this they had this um, uh, piece of legislation that would let people um, that would let people vote even if they didn't qualify to vote, and they called it like the Martin Luther King Civil Rights Act. It had nothing to do with Martin Luther King or civil rights. And so Black Lives Matter is kind of the same thing. Um, if you go to the Black Lives Matter website, they tell you what they're about. They're about destroying America. I mean, they, they come right out and say it. It's not Tom Duggan saying it. It's them saying it. Um, so we're going to have the Chiefs on. But it, in the last couple of weeks, I got a call from a good friend of mine, John Zimini, who's on the, I believe he's still on the school committee in Drake it. And John said, hey, Tom, you know those pol pro-police rallies you've been having every th two or three years? Because I've been doing pro-police rallies now going back at least 10 years. Uh, John has always come and supported us. So he said, listen, we're going to do a rolling rally in support of law enforcement. So, hey, I'm always in. If you're going to do something to help law enforcement, I'm in. So I posted it on Facebook. We get a bunch of Valley Patriot people to come. And uh, we went to Drake it. And we all assembled. And we drove from Drake it into Methuen, past the police station. Everybody waved to show the Methuen police that we care about them and the fact that they're willing to put their lives on the line for people who don't give a shit about their lives being put on the line. And um, you wouldn't believe the fucking controversy 
You wouldn't. Be, you. It's almost like when we turn the clocks back in the in the turn the clocks ahead in the spring. It's like we went from like Eastern Standard Time to the Twilight Zone because. You just you just can't believe what I'm about to tell you guys. Even if you read it in the Tribune, you're still not going to believe what I'm telling you guys. So this was a rally. We had about 100 cars. We went from Drake to Lawrence. There were no problems. There were four protesters outside Drake High School. Um, obviously brainwashed kids who were there because their teachers told them that it was a good idea to be there. And when it was all over, I, we all kind of felt good that we showed law enforcement that, you know, there are still people out in the community that care that they go out and put themselves between a bullet and an innocent person. And you wouldn't believe the contrary. You just, you, I'm still befuddled at how stupid so many people are in this country. Like we were talking before, the, uh, before we went on the air. When I was growing up, like 10% of the people you ran into in the general population were just total morons. They did stupid things, they believed stupid things, they said stupid things, and you just go, yep, the guy's a moron, and you just ignored him. But now it's like 10% of the people are normal, and 90% of the people out there are just batshit fucking crazy. We, have a, we, had a, we had a rolling rally in support of law enforcement, and then the Black Lives Matter people who got so worked up that we had a rally for law enforcement and we took five minutes away from the attention that they were getting every day. They packed into, I believe it was Methuen High School, although it might have been another school, because Neil Perry, one of his bad decisions, decided that he was going to have some kind of a listening forum for Black Lives Matter. So all of us white people, we could all listen to people that are with Black Lives Matter tell us how racist we are. And one lady got up and said, you know, but white people are racist. They don't even realize how racist we are. Like, we're so racist being white that we don't, even if we don't think we're racist, that's a sign that we're racist. And if you deny that you're a racist, that is also a sign that you're a racist. So everything white people do is racist. The first three people that got up just eviscerated me, which was hilarious. Because, number one, I didn't organize the event. I was in it. I promoted it. But I didn't organize the event. I didn't do anything at the event that would offend anybody other than I think I threw the finger to the Black Lives Matter people while they were protesting. Um, but, you know, given the fact that when one of us steps out of line, it's like throwing somebody the finger. When someone on their side steps out of line, they burn down police stations. So it really, f spare me the fake outrage, okay? I, I, th I thought at the beginning when this lady, was, the first lady got up and was eviscerating me that that's what she was talking about. Because I was live on Facebook when I did it and I announced that I just threw them the finger. No, 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 no. This was a racist rally, they all said. This was a racist rally. It's ra Run, the racism's going to get you. Run. Because one of the trucks in the caravan had a Trump sign on it, a bumper sticker. I think it was a bumper sticker that said, all lives matter. You would have thought it said, kill all the black people. You would have thought it said Martin Luther King was a, was a bastard. These people got up and called it a racist rally. Then they pressured the police chief to denounce the rally. We were doing it for them. So I've known Joe Solomon for probably 30 years. He's one of my best friends. I say it all the time. Um, and I say it out of, out of a disclaimer because when I defend him, I want people to know he's my friend. And you can take that into account as to whether, you know, how much weight you give to it. I believe in transparency. They pressured Joe Solomon. They wanted him to denounce the rally, which he did not do. But one of the things that he did do was he issued a press release saying that the Methuen police does not comport with, and I'm paraphrasing, does not believe that all lives matter. Does not believe in the phrase, all lives matter. Now, you've got to be a fucking moron. Seriously to stand up at a forum at Methuen High or wherever it was and say the phrase, all lives matter is racist. You've got to be an idiot. Because the whole concept that all lives matter is what helped free the slaves. It's what helped get us our civil rights legislation so that people who were thought of as less of a life would be thought of as equal. Joe Solomon, and I think that it's because his boss made him, who's not here today, so I wanted to ask him about that, um, made the statement that he does not agree with the idea that all lives matter. Listen, I love Joe. He's my friend, but that doesn't mean he's always right. and It doesn't mean I'm always going to defend him. And on this one, I'm not going to. In fact, I'm going the other way. 
you are a police officer because all lives matter. Your entire fucking job is to go out there and make sure that you protect all lives regardless of race. If we are not a colorblind police department, if we are not a colorblind municipal government, if we are not a colorblind society, then we are a, by definition, a racist society. And anybody who says that all lives, all lives don't matter, that all lives matter is bad, that is a phrase that's bad, you are a racist. You just are. You're an idiot on top of it all, but you're an idiot racist. So I'm watching this, and these people are getting, one lady, Shibilia, Shibilia, got up and went on and on and on about how this was such a, it was disgraceful. She was so worked up, you would have thought someone drove over her puppy. It was just, someone had a Trump sign. It was, it said, all lives matter. Wow. Like, it. I didn't realize there were this many stupid people. And here's the other thing. Eunice Ziegler, who is black, who is a member of the Methuen City Council, who was my candidate for council president, if everybody remembers. Jim McCarty was up for it. I was pushing for Eunice. I made phone calls for Eunice. By the way, donated money to Eunice's campaign, campaigned for Eunice, endorsed Eunice, the only black person running in Methuen, long before all this Tom Duggan's a racist bullshit started. And I'm sitting there watching, and I'm like, is anyone going to defend me? Like, they're just going to let someone get up and slander someone at the microphone, and everybody sitting there is just going to sit there, like no one's going to have anything to say? So I called a few people afterwards, and the answer that I got was, well, Tom, this was a listening forum. We weren't there to say stuff. We were just there to listen. So now I'm wondering, what did this accomplish? You gave rise, and you gave voices publicly to people who, A, desperately want to be recognized publicly or they wouldn't be there, and B, to the dumbest members of our community. You have now taken people who, before the internet, before live video, would just be the 10% morons in their neighborhoods. And the people around them will go, yeah, that guy's a moron. And you've now elevated them to a position of importance by giving them a microphone and giving them a say. You want to say, run for office. We had five people running for six jobs on the school committee in Methuen. Not one of them is a minority, not one. And yet the people at the, at the Black Lives Matter forum in Methuen got up and said, look, there's no, there isn't proper representation of minorities in Methuen among the elected officials. Well, yeah, the one black person that ran won. One black person ran, Nuna Ziegler, and she won. If you want more representation by minorities in your municipal government, here's an idea, run for office. If there are no minority candidates to vote for, how do you blame Methuen for being racist for not having more minorities in elected public positions? Again, five people ran for six jobs on the school committee Methuen, and this was after we found out the school department overspent $4.8 million the year before. They overspent $2.8 million the year before that. That the superintendent wasn't certified to be a superintendent. That she wasn't even certified to be a principal when she applied for superintendent and was put forth to be superintendent. That people were getting raises while people were getting laid off. That money was missing. That money was was supposedly going to... Uh, um, um, uh, uh, what did she say that all the money was going? Special education, when a lot of the money was going to give administrators raises. And after all of that, after all the turmoil, after all the controversy and conflict, five people gave a shit enough to run for school committee in Methuen. So please, you know, I know, I know that there are dumb people out there. Don't appease them, Neil Perry members of the city council, don't appease them. Don't give them a microphone. Most of them are just downright idiots. Some of them mean well, I'm sure. I'm sure they do. I'm sure some of them are very nice people. I'm not saying that they're bad people. I'm not saying they kick puppies. That's what the other side does. But what I am saying is that they're dumb. And they shouldn't be given a platform to spread their dumbness. Tucker Carlson said something last night that was just so brilliant, I'm going to repeat it. He said, you know, a virus works, it spreads very exponentially. One person gets the virus, they go into a store, they come into contact with 10 people. Those 10 people go into a different store and infect 100 people, and it, and it, and it grows exponentially. Stupidity works the same way. You get one stupid person at a microphone that says one stupid thing, and 100 people hear it, and then you could actually, if you listen really closely, if you go back on the internet and you watch the listening forum for Black Lives Matter in Methuen, 
every time someone says something dumb, if you listen really carefully, you can hear brain cells all over the Merrimack Valley dying. Because stupidity breeds stupidity. And these people are up there, this one's a racist, and Tom Duggan's a racist, and the Valley Patriots, how can a newspaper be racist? Uh, that, that, one, that one I don't understand. You want to call me a racist, we can have that discussion. I, 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 can, I can certainly, I as a human being can certainly rest on my track record of recruiting Latino candidates in Lawrence, managing campaigns for Marcos Devers and Jewish Grisel Silva, and I can go back 20 years of giving scholarships to kids at Lawrence High School that are Latino. But if that makes me a racist, that makes you stupid. Because racism actually means something. When you run around throwing the word racism around to everybody who does something you don't like, what you do is you cheapen the word racist so that when someone who's a real racist, someone who really hates black people, someone who would never vote for a Eunice Deagle, someone who would campaign against the Marcos Devers, then when you call that person a racist, it doesn't really mean anything anymore. You're not really calling them out because it's like everything else. You overdo it, you overdo it, you overdo it, and then you cheapen the word, you minimize the, the, the severity of what the word racist is supposed to mean. So I'm a, little, I'm a little unnerved that Joe Solomon, my friend, whom I know doesn't really believe that way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, would say in a press release that he doesn't believe that all lives matter. Your job is to go out and protect all lives. In fact, if you ask me, all lives matter should be on the side of every police car in America. I don't know how, I don't know how you can say, anybody can say, that because people who don't like Black Lives Matter use that slogan, therefore we have to denounce that slogan, even though the words are actually true that all lives matter. Like, only in politics can you take something that's so obvious, so obviously true, and turn it into untrue, turn it into something that shouldn't be spoken, something that should be censored. Well, because racist people say all lives matter. Well, I'm sure some racist people do. And I'm sure some, peop- some racist people like to eat oranges. And if you eat oranges, that doesn't make you a racist because racists eat oranges. You know? And I'm always hearing, well, you know, the police in, in, in uh, the United States are just like the Nazis. The Nazis wore uniforms. And police wear uniforms. So that makes them Nazis. Yeah, it does if you're stupid. If you're a moron, it does. But if you're a thinking person who can actually ask questions of yourself and others and can use logic and reason, suddenly none of that makes any sense at all. I'm going to say one more thing. Where are we on time? Well, we're good. Um, We're watching statues being taken down all over America. We're watching George Washington be defaced all over the country. A couple things on this. The first is when, when Donald Trump said a year ago, that people taking down statues to the Confederacy is going to end up in George Washington and Thomas Jefferson being taken down, CNN and the Democrats ridiculed and mocked him for three years over it until all of a sudden it's now starting to happen. Now, that doesn't mean Donald Trump was a genius. He was just smart enough to see where this is going because the left always goes too far. And this is one of the reasons why Donald Trump, by the way, is president, like him or not. Donald Trump is president because for the last 30 years, we've had Democrats and Republicans selling us out to each other, making deals with each other to screw the American people. And then at election time, Democrats run to the left, Republicans run to the right. They say, we're going to lower your taxes, we're going to cut the debt, we're going to build the military. Then they get in and never do it. And finally, a guy like Donald Trump, again, love him or hate him, the reason he's president is because a guy came along that didn't speak the pretty language of politics that refuse to play by their rules. Every day CNN, do you, want to denounce, do you want to denounce what you said yesterday? Do you want to denounce what you said five minutes ago? Then going to other people, do you want to denounce what Donald Trump said? Can you denounce, Donald Trump said mean things. Do you want to denounce it? And the reason he didn't denounce what he said, and the reason why most people, smart people, did not denounce what he said, is because A, what he was saying wasn't racist. It was true. And the media, just like with the phrase All Lives Matter, has, and, and public education has brainwashed our society to believe that things that are true are not allowed to be said out loud. It might hurt someone's feelings. It might be racist. My daughter is 25. I never talk about my daughter. My daughter is 25, 26 years old. I asked her one day when we were having lunch. I said, because she's very liberal. I said, can something be racist and also be true? 
Can you say something that's true and have it also be racist? Her answer was yes. Like, I talked to my daughter because she's in that age group, and I, it's not about her, it's about her, her demographic. It's about people her age. Young people have been so brainwashed over this race issue that they can't even formulate, what's the word? I don't want to sound like Joe Biden here, where I'm, I'm, I'm trying to choose my words so carefully that I end up stammering. But they can't even formulate basic reasoned questions as to, like, how is it possibly bad to say all lives matter? Like, how is that even possible? They can't have a coherent argument. Right. That's really what it comes down and to. And so when they, when they don't have the facts on their side to have an adult, a grown-up argument, discussion about our disagreements, they throw racism. Because that shuts down all debate. You're a racist. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. And you know what you're not doing while all that's going on? You're not talking about the substance of the issue. And this is why people get up at Black Lives Matter listening forums and start yelling and screaming about racism. One lady get up and said she wants to boycott all my advertisers. Please, please boycott my advertisers. The last time a boycott of my advertisers took place was three years ago. And you have no idea how much money I made on that. You have no friggin' clue how much money I made when friends of Steve Saber started calling the Thuin Family Restaurant and AFC Urgent Care and all these other places and saying, Tom Duggan's evil. He said, he said that Steve Saber's wife should get raped. Remember that? When they just made that up, that I said that Steve Saber's wife was going to be raped, right? They called all my advertisers. One guy actually dropped in on one of my advertisers. And I made so much money because the backlash, people heard that there was a boycott and people were calling me asking me for ad rates. Hey, Tom, I heard they're trying to boycott you. Could you are you losing advertising? Let me put my business card in. How much is it? So please, if you want to boycott my show, you want to boycott my newspaper, that's fine. That's fine. I'm okay with that because the last time that happened, I made a shit ton of money. All right. And especially with COVID and everything else, I could use a good boycott right now. I was hoping they were going to have pickets outside the Studio 21 Podcast Cafe back when the Sabre stuff was happening. I don't, I, I, what really needs to happen is normal people need to start fighting back. Regular, ordinary people of all stripes, of all races, need to start fighting back. And it's starting to happen. You're starting to see people... We saw the couple with their uh, automatic weapons in St. Louis this week. The media, because they were defending themselves, immediately made them white supremacists. Then when you look into who this guy is, he's a Democrat who supported Hillary Clinton. He's a lawyer in St. Louis who's representing a black guy that's suing the police department for racism. That's the guy you call the white supremacist on CNN. Good job. Good job. Unfortunately, you've got a million people that watch CNN every day, and that's really their cap. It's a million. You've got a million people that watch CNN every day who believe everything that they say. And don't even bother to just, hey, let's look this guy up, because that's what I did. I'm watching CNN, Don Lemon's talking about how this guy's a white supremacist. I've lived my whole life. I think I've met three white supremacists in my life. I don't think anybody that I know has ever met a white supremacist. So they said the guy's name on CNN. I Googled the guy's name. I pulled it up St. Louis. I see that he's a lawyer. I look for his picture to make sure it's the right guy. Then I start looking through some of the cases that he's filed, and I'm like, holy crap, this guy's not a Trump supporter. This guy didn't have an All Lives Matter bumper sticker on his, on his truck. He didn't have a Trump sign on his truck. This guy's a lily white liberal, a left-wing, rich, entitled, elitist liberal who just wanted to protect his wife and his property. And CNN and MSNBC and the New York Times and the Boston Globe made this guy the, the head of the Ku Klux Klan. It's amazing. It's amazing. I know we got Phil. I have one more thing I want to touch on here. Um, it reminds me of, and you really need to, if, if you follow me on a regular bit, you re, I posted it the other day, you really need to Google this or go on the Valley Patriot website and type in the name Shiva, S-H-I-V-A. Now, this guy, Shiva, is a complete lunatic, and he ran for Senate against Elizabeth Warren. He's a left-wing, I mean, just batshit crazy. I mean, he makes Elizabeth Warren look sane. This guy, three years ago, 2017, decided to have a free speech rally on the Common in Boston. I put on Channel 7, and there's uh, a new report, news report, breaking news, Channel 7. This isn't CNN now. This is local Boston Channel 7. Breaking news, a white supremacist rally on the common in Boston. 
I said, shit. So I called up a couple of my new spotters and I said, hey, they're having a white supremacist rally in Boston. Can, can any of you guys get down there and take some pictures and video for me? You know, it'd be great for the paper. We'll have like, you know, original photos. We don't have to steal from the Globe or anything. So about an hour and a half later, one of my new spotters goes live from the white supremacist rally at the Boston Common and the darkest black man in the world is holding a microphone. His name is Ayadora Shiva. If you follow Howie Carr, you're probably familiar with him. They had a big blowout on the air one day. It was probably the greatest radio ever. And this guy was up there with signs that said, Black Lives Matter. Defund the police. I think that was one of them. Um, uh, something about uh, global warming. Uh, attacks on corporate media. And he, he's one of these... Um, He's one of these people that uh, thinks Monsantos is part of some conspiracy to poison us all. So while I'm watching on my computer screen a live Facebook feed of Ayadora Shiva, the blackest black man you're ever going to see in your life, with his microphone attacking corporate America and yelling Black Lives Matter, on my TV screen, Channel 7, who's not showing his face, this is if they're not, if they're telling you something on the news, but they're not showing you video, they're lying. They didn't show it. They were showing the counter protesters, the Black Lives Matter counter protesters, who were there to stop the evil white racists, who were there to counter the white supremacists. And so, on one screen in my office, I've got a chyron that says "white supremacist rally in Boston," and on my computer screen, I've got the darkest black man I've ever seen in my life saying "Black Lives Matter," who apparently is supposed to be the white supremacist. And I said, I texted my friend that was there, and I said, "Get some pictures. We'll put it in the paper." We did a front page story, the Nazi rally that never happened. I sent it to Tucker. I sent it to Fox News. I sent it to every cable news station podcast you can imagine. Not one person picked it up. Not one. So people in Boston still believe that there was a white supremacist rally on the Boston Common because Channel 4, Channel 5, Channel 7, WB, they all outright lied to you. And they didn't make a mistake because they were there. They could see Ayodora Shiva. They just chose not to put the cameras on him because if they did, everyone at home would see what I was seeing. This wasn't a white supremacist rally. Why did they do this? You would think... 457, WB, Fox, they're supposed to be in competition with each other. You would think if they were in competition with each other, one of the producers would have said, wait a minute, everybody else is reporting the wrong thing. Let's turn the cameras on this guy and tell him what's really going on, that our ratings will go up, we'll make more money, right? We'll have the exclusive. Not one of them did that. Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why. Because the media is complicit in trying to gin up racial hatred in this country. Four, five, and seven in Boston are no different than CNN. They are there to whip up conflict and controversy so they can make money. And they're all in and out together. All right, I had a bunch of things I wanted to talk to about Methuen. Um, but on the line, maybe we'll only do 15 minutes with, with Phil unless he can give us a little more. Uh, on the line, we have one of my friends. Now he's my, one of my, I have a lot of liberal friends, Ben. And... It's amazing how people are shocked at that because liberals aren't supposed to have friends that are conservatives anymore and vice versa. But one of my very liberal Democrat friends is Phil, we call him Phil of the Future, De Collegero. I always vote for him every time he runs for the, the Board of Selectmen, even though he's liberal. And I'm going to tell you why right now as we introduce him. Phil De Collegero doesn't just sit at a meeting every two weeks and vote on what comes before him. He goes out in the community and is proactive. He has helped the uh, Downtown Merchant Association with the Farmer's Market. He has helped with uh, the Sheep Shearing Festival, with the Fall Festival. Anything that's going on in the community, Phil, when he's not sitting as a Board of Selectmen member, is out in the community doing stuff. And by the way, not saying, look at me. He's the guy that's out there doing the work and then giving other people credit. And that's what I want from a member of my Board of Selectmen. I don't care how liberal they are. I want someone that's proactive at the local level. So I always support Phil. Phil, I am glad that you are here. Was that a good introduction or no? I, I appreciate it, Tom. There were times where you were not so kind in things that you used to say about me. So I, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> well, but all of those were true. So that's the reason I had to say them. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, but, but just, again, just because we're friends, this goes back to the Joe Solomon thing. People think that I defend Joe because he's my friend. Phil's my friend. I don't defend him all the time. Sometimes he's wrong, and I come on here and I tell you that I think he was wrong about stuff. It's called being objective. 
And I like Phil because he is also objective. One of Phil's jobs that most people don't know is he works for the Chamber of Commerce in Amesbury. Can you tell us about that a little bit, Phil? Uh, sure. So up in Amesbury, which is a little bit um, of a smaller community than you know the greater Lawrence towns and cities. Um, so Amesbury is about 17,000 people, just over 17,000 people. And their Chamber of Commerce up here is a pretty active group of about um, just shy of 300 um, businesses ranging in size from some of the larger banks in the area to um, artisans who are just making things out of their own home. And so it's an organization that was um, put together um, by community leaders um, several decades ago with the intention of helping boost the Amesbury economy. Um, not surprising. I mean, it's very similar to the stories of chambers and boards of trade and merchants associations um, across the country. And so um, my job is to help support our business community um, up in Amesbury, and not just Amesbury, but we have members that are in Salisbury, Newbury, Port, Southern New Hampshire, um, Rowley, Merrimack. And so um, whether it's helping them with things as simple as printing, um, whether it's doing uh, advertising, marketing, um, or whether it's creating events that help bring people down to our pretty lively downtown, actually, um, all that falls on me. So it's been a pretty fun experience. You had me at advertising. Uh, you don't bring your Valley Patriots up here anymore, Tom. Though, we're, do you? We're, we're up there. We're outside the post. We have a box outside the post office at the bus stop. That's our only location in Amesbury, but we do have one. Hmm, and, that, and, that's be, and that's because Jim Kelkos one day said to me, if you put a box in Amesbury, people will read it. I love your paper, but I can never find it. I got to go to Salisbury to get it. So we put one there, and we always stick about 50 papers in the box. And when we go the next month, there's always like one or two left. So I know people take them. Cool. Well, uh, I think that for a lot of people in Greater Lawrence, not many of them come up here or think of coming up here right away. I think it's easy to hop onto 495 and just keep driving up to the beach, right? right. Because when it's a nice day out, like a nice day today um, or the weekend that we're looking forward to, you know, people just, they're drawn to the beach. And so it's not always their first instinct to pull off a couple exits earlier and check out what I think is a pretty, um, pretty well hidden gem. I mean, we're 20, 25 minutes away in Greater Lawrence and, um, I'm hearing people talk more and more about what Amesbury has to offer, but it's funny how, you know, growing up and even just in my 20s, it, it wasn't a place that I think people knew much about. And really, I, I think as as the secret's getting out, people are coming and they're checking it out. In fact, even just sitting here right now, I'm spying some people I know from down to the Merrimack Valley that are out here having lunch. So I think that's cool. Um, so, yeah, so you should come up more often, you know, and grab a bite to eat. We don't have a Taco Bell up here, Tom. Uh, listen, listen when, you, when you get a Taco so. Bell, let me know. And then maybe we can have that conversation. I, I, we have we have plenty of authentic Mexican places up here. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, listen, I, I, I've been to Amesbury downtown maybe five or six times in the last year or two. Uh, once I had to go, a guy was selling uh, newspaper boxes. And, uh, and so I went up and, and I was kind of hanging around downtown afterwards for a little while. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful little community. And it, it's really weird because it kind of more reminds me of Andover than North Andover. It kind of reminds me more of a much more upscale com downtown than North Andover has. Um, I think it, it definitely has the bones. And I'm, I, with all due respect to both Andover and North Andover, the bones down here for their downtown just are, are great. I mean, they, it, it's not a downtown that they just built structurally, mm -hmm. you know, with the past couple of years. I mean, there's definitely a lot of history behind these buildings. But there's also just the geography of where they chose to build these. So... You know, 100 years ago, you know, 150, 200 years ago even, um, you had a lot of uh, mill construction activity up here built around the Pow Wow River. And so now today those mills are full of office spaces, restaurants, um, retail shops, gift shops, crafters, makers. Um, and it's all built around um, what previously was the engine of the economy, the Pow Wow River, the falls. And so when you come up to Amesbury, um, you drive through our downtown and it's quaint. I think it's something straight out of a, like a Norman Rockwell painting. Really neat shops, again, right on the downtown. But what you don't see, unless you end up pulling over and getting out of your car to check it out, is that there's this whole courtyard right in our market square where there's a whole amphitheater, waterfalls, and you can actually eat next to this river. And it's, it's not like, you know, eating at Salvatore's and Lawrence next to the, the mighty Merrimack, but it still is a pretty cool experience that, you know, well, there's tons of outdoor dining by the coast, you know, from, you know, Gloucester all the way up to, you know, Salem, Gloucester, up to Newburyport, you know, Salisbury, Hampton. It's not very often that you get to have you know an outdoor dining experience or come hang out with your family around this. Talk to me about parking because when I was up in Amesbury last, I had a very difficult time finding parking downtown. Sure. So there's on-street parking, but if you come down here and you end up hitting um, the rotary that we have in Market Square, 
you zip down, you know, literally just take a right bare right down to um, Water Street, and there's a parking deck right there. So there's, you know, two levels of parking, um, plenty of space. I think that we would definitely like to see more. I know that that's a, a big priority for our mayor and city hall, and obviously a big priority for our business community. And so if you were either to take down Water Street or you were to go up Friend Street where the parking dog ale house is, um, there's more public parking right there. But, yeah, I mean, it can fill up pretty quick, but that's because uh, – a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of people like to go to Amesbury downtown. So with, when all this COVID happened, um, how has that affected Amesbury? Has it affected it the way that it has affected Lawrence? And could you talk a little bit about the ridiculous restrictions that I'm sure the town has put on businesses to reopen? Uh, so two very different questions, right? So I, I'm surprised at how well our business community seems to have weathered this storm. And by well, I mean... Their morale still is high. They refuse to take it sitting down. A lot of our restaurant owners, um, they had to get creative and they did a lot of takeout. Um, and that can be stressful. I don't think that a lot of people, and actually, forgive me, maybe it's been discussed in prior episodes, just how much work as a restaurant owner, um, as a chef, when you're accustomed to having people come and sit down in your site and instead you're turning around and, and adapting to a takeout business model, that's, that's a lot. We have Kitchen Local up here. Um, it's a community kitchen where um, aspiring entrepreneurs, instead of them having to build their own kitchen or go and you know, lease space and do this huge amount of capital investment, um, this community kitchen um, has um, young entrepreneurs starting out um, be able to take advantage of their space. And it's predominantly catering. And what a lot of those businesses end up doing was they can't do catering. You know, events were canceled. They ended up doing takeout businesses themselves. And so businesses got creative and I was, I was happy to see it. Um, but there's no denying that these businesses after three months, three and a half months of being closed, it's, it's been a struggle. And so you had asked about restrictions that you know, the municipalities are putting on. I have to actually say that you know, this municipality has been really great. Good. Um, in fact, I think we were allotted about two, two and a half weeks ago because they didn't miss a beat. In fact, beat was the name of the, um, group that city hall created. They brought together small retailers, restaurants, myself from the chamber, um, city hall staff, to talk about, okay, you know, here we are, it's the you know beginning of May, we know that recovery is going to be coming, we know the governor said May 18th was going to be when opening start, we didn't know what that meant, but we just know it meant progress. And so immediately that committee started working together to make sure that we had outdoor dining solutions. And so the city put, you know, using Jersey barriers, they put um, several almost parklet type outdoor seating um, opportunities downtown. So I think we're up to, we're up to three, but um, we're going to hit four. Um, they created outdoor dining spaces, you know, in our market square on our bullnose where, you know, normally, you know, we have games out during the summertime, you know, they put picnic tables. Um, yeah, there's an expectation that, you know, people are wearing masks both inside, um, inside businesses. But even if you're just walking around trying to get that mask worn, because, you know, right now, Massachusetts has the distinction of being um, a place that's opening back up because there are fewer cases of COVID and our hospitals aren't overwhelmed. And if it means wearing masks for a little bit longer, listen, I hate wearing a mask. I hate it. You can't talk. As you can tell, I'm, I'm a pretty speedy speaker. And so basically I'm about to pass out when I'm doing this behind right. a mask. Um, but that being said, you know, as long as we're acting responsibly in that, in that regard, I mean, we can continue on this path. We just found out that you know, July 6th, next Monday is phase three of our reopening. Other states that were naturally frustrated um, are all of a sudden seeing these spikes in cases. I would be really nervous if I, you know, and if I were in this role in Florida or Texas, I would be really nervous for my business community right now because we can't afford, they can't afford a second spike. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can stay on this path. And if people can have a little bit more patience, I mean, we're seeing those bipartisan calls at the federal level, whether the Democrats or Republicans, you know, U.S. senators are saying, and not that they're necessarily, you know, the ones we should be looking to for guidance per se, but, you know, in a time where it's very difficult to find agreement between those two parties, they're saying, you know what, just don the masks right now. Let's, right. let's amp this thing out. So I know it would make, you know, make it tougher for you to smoke your cigarettes with those masks on, but you know what? Yeah. By the way, um, I'm not even going to get into the North End of a stuff. Um, what is the chamber? Uh, I, I'm definitely going to have Joe Bivalacqua on at some point. Um, he's the head of the, I think, Haverhill Chamber. Um, I, Valley Chamber, so. Valley Ch I, I apologize. Um, no. they, they've been offering webinars and they've been offering help to businesses in the Merrimack Valley. 
is Amesbury doing that? Are the, uh, is Amesbury Chamber of Commerce offering help in, by way of uh, loans or grants or uh, webinars? Or what, what is it that the Amesbury Chamber is doing uh, to help all of these businesses that are struggling? Maybe some of them have been open for takeout, but you know, what about the law offices that haven't been? What about the, the nail salons that haven't been? What is the Amesbury Chamber offering to help those businesses? So when this happened, um, I didn't use Zoom before. It's funny. I think, and I, I apologize to viewers or listeners because, you know, Tom had invited me on the show and I didn't realize, you know, I've gotten so accustomed to these Zoom meetings that I didn't realize it was meant to be in person. So yeah, we never, sorry, by the way, we never stopped. We continued doing shows right through COVID. Well, I, I, I appreciate the, you know, the quick turnaround because I know that you, you know, you needed to fill space quickly and then, you know, kind of got a curveball thrown at you at like one forty five, where I was like, I'm not, I, I can't go into Salem. Right. But, um, what we ended up doing early on was our, our business owners, because people were forced to close, and certainly those that weren't forced to close had to exercise social distancing. And so you had this really uncertain time, this pinch in their pocketbook, and these business owners that normally speak to each other, it felt like they were disconnected. And so we as a chamber immediately went to work. We contacted both as, as staff, but also several, several of our members immediately began reaching out to all of our members and trying to get them on the phone and asking them, you know, what are their needs? Are you okay? And it's funny, a lot of them, they weren't okay, but at that point, there weren't programs necessarily available, but they needed someone to talk to. And so they'd say, you know, yeah, you know, it, it's been a struggle. And then they'd spend 45 minutes on the phone, clearly just needing to talk and communicate with other people and, and learn about what's happening just in general, how are other businesses doing. Um, and so that's one of the benefits of opening back up is the sense of community kind of returning. Um, and it, I shouldn't even say kind of, it is returning. Um, what we saw, though, was that a lot of our businesses didn't know how to necessarily navigate the bureaucracy of the, you know, the, the PPP. Um, or whether they should apply for certain um, emergency loan funding through the SBA. And so uh, we immediately had um, actually Senator DiZoglio, Rep. Kelt Course, and our mayor, Cassandra Gove, as well as our community development director. We created a Zoom program um, where um, our business owners were able to get on there, learn about the, the changes in, in local and state policy, the programs that were available, but then also ask questions because you know, I think people like you and I, I don't know if you take it for granted, Tom, I take it for granted how easy it is sometimes to contact our local leaders and state leaders to get guidance on mm -hmm. these things. Our business owners, they feel like they can't just pick up the phone and do that. And fortunately in Amesbury and other communities in the Merrimack Valley too, they can. And so we organized one of those events. We had um, Congressman Seth Moulton bring a representative from the SBA um, and actually host a forum with our Amesbury business owners to help again, navigate that, that stressful process. Mm -hmm. Policies were changing so quickly early on. In fact, that Senator DeZoglio and Rep. Telcourse, and actually I wanted to give a shout out to Rep. Lenny Mira as well, because He's we have best. many members. Love him. Um, at, you know, early on, many years ago, you know, Rep. Mira and I, we used to go on that show. What, what was it called? Paying Attention, I think, was yes. the show. Yes. No, that, um, but uh, because we have members in Merrimack, we tried to create opportunities where, again, they were getting updates from leaders they were familiar with because state policy really was changing almost on a daily basis. So, pandemic unemployment assistance, you know, our businesses didn't necessarily understand that, you know, a lot of our independently employed people, realtors, for instance, the whole concept of applying for these programs, they weren't even accustomed to thinking of these programs as being an option for them. And so helping educate them and connect them with resources. Uh, the state's been really great about getting us information and then, you know, relying on us as chambers of Congress, for instance, to get that information out to members. And so um, we were doing that. Um, we were leveraging our social media activity, our email list to make sure our members got their information about their own businesses out to uh, approximately 1,600 people on our email lists. Uh, a lot of chambers charge to do blast emails for our, for their members. I waived all of that. I'm still waived all of that. Good for you. Because that's fair to ask businesses to pay for things like that. Now, granted, chambers of commerce, while well, nonprofits qualify for a lot of programs at the federal level, chambers of commerce did not. Um, so there were no um, PPP loans coming my way. We could have applied for the emergency loans, but again, those are loans. And so for, as a Chamber of Commerce, we normally do events to help um, support our budget. Um, you know, more than 50% of our budget comes from the events that we sponsor throughout the year. And we either had to cancel or postpone about $90,000 worth of events just Ouch. during this pandemic. So, um, yeah, we've been striving to make sure that we deliver on those services. You know, we do something in Amesbury where our business owners, um, we create welcome bags for our realtors. 
So whenever a home is sold in the area, you know, our realtor members, you know, give a welcome bag. Hey, welcome to the city. Kind of like that welcome wagon concept that used to really be prevalent. Right. Um, but those bags are full of information about our members. Some members put gift cards in, some put coupons, some put pens. Um, some just put flyers or menus in, but it's a way to just, you know, for a business, for a person who's coming to the community or the area, um, it's a way for them to learn about all that there is to offer. So we do that and that's free for our members. Um, one of the things like a curveball that I think a lot of businesses felt was being thrown at them is, you know, how do you manage employees during this? Especially as reopenings happened, people didn't know what to expect. Our business owners didn't know what to expect from employees because there's a, such a spectrum of how we're handling this right now. Right. You know, some people are really strictly wearing masks and don't want to be near another human being. Other people don't care, you know, damn the masks. Let's, you know, let's start hugging and kissing again. Right. And so, Naturally, there are certain laws that exist and the expectation from, you know, that employers can have of employees um, needs to be set. Otherwise, those employees get in trouble. And so we actually just did a forum last week um, and we, we record all these Zoom calls, Tom, because not every member has the ability to just stop what they're doing to come on these calls. And so, you know, we used to do mixers and, and these type of things in person. And if you missed it, you missed it. Um, so one of the benefits is like these Zoom calls, like what we did last week where we had an employment law attorney. Um, and the HR, um, the VP of HR from the Provident Bank, as well as um, Matt Sherrill from Gould Insurance, you know, lead a panel to talk about just how employers should be approaching their relationship with employees as they bring these employees back to work. You know, everything from FMLA to what you can expect employees, um, what you can expect from them during an environment like this, any law or policy changes that went into effect for employees, um, you know, unemployment expectations, you know, some of our business owners have found, actually many of our business owners have found it really difficult to get certain employees back to work because the reality is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm progressive. I think that the, you know, we need a robust unemployment assistance program. The way that this policy was structured um, has made it very difficult for our, our restaurants and, and retailers to get employees back to work because, of just the, the generous benefits. So these, these retailers are trying to reopen, these restaurants are trying to reopen. Um, and so it's been a little bit more difficult. Um, how, how does somebody join, to make, make your pitch for the Amesbury Chamber of Commerce. I'm not a big fan of chambers of commerce in general, but I think there are a few that do good work. I think the Mary right. McValley one that Joe Bevilacqua runs does some pretty good work. And I think you guys do some pretty good work up there too. How, m- make your pitch. How does somebody join the chamber? What is the cost and what is the benefit? Sure. So if you want to join the Amesbury Chamber of Commerce, you can either go online, www.amesburychamber.com, or give me a call. I mean, give me a ring on my cell phone, even 508-423-6709. Um, every chamber does things differently. At our chamber, you know, we're located right in the center of our downtown. We have, you know, one of the office size printer, scanner, copiers, faxes um, available, our laminator. I mean, if you have something you need printed, a lot of our members use us. A lot of our realtors are, 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 are professionals that don't necessarily have office space downtown but use it for meetings. They'll come here if they have to print out materials or documents or if they need something faxed or scanned. A lot of times they'll email it to me if they need some type of poster put together. I and mean, we do things as, as simple as that to, again, creating these type of educational programs. Um, I've been a little bit lax about whether you have to be a member to attend these during this crisis. Um, but normally you have to be a member to be able to access those Zooms or to access our business and breakfast where we try to educate you know, businesses about strategies. Um, again, prior to this happening, for instance, you, we had our friend Brian McGonigal actually come up here and um, walk 30 of our members through how they should write press releases in order to get information out to newspapers because um, we as a chamber don't want to see newspapers die because you know, they're a source of education, information, and advertising to get their message as business owners out to the, the potential consumers or clients that exist. Right. Um, so if you're somebody who wants to join a chamber, you're somebody to look for business support or be part of a community. Um, I mean, by all means, give me a call. If you're up in Merrimack, Amesbury, Salisbury, Newburyport, um, you're a business owner or professional who does business up here. Give me a call again, or you can just simply apply online at amesburychamber.com and, I talk really quickly, Tom. That's a, that, that, listen, so that's okay. Uh, we will we'll only got a couple of minutes left. Why don't you make a pitch for some of your members uh, that are open, that people can go and patronize, whether it's a restaurant or a law office or a nail, nail salon. Um, well, not know? everybody, not everybody is like you and needs to patronize a law office as frequently. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> um, but you know, if you're somebody who enjoys that, you know, experience, like again, that small town experience where you can actually go and hop from shop to shop. You know, we've got plenty of creative gift shops up here from Little Things by Nest, um, which is run by Taylor Simpson, is actually originally from Andover. 
We have 18 Friend Street, or honestly, you know, a really neat general store up here with an old time um, soda fountain, which is called Hedgehog General Store. That's all within walking distance. They're all within about a thousand feet of each other. Um, you can come check out Willie Joe Woody's, which is, you know, an awesome um, uh, fashion boutique that's up here. We have Trendsetters Fashion Boutique that's also up here. Businesses like Hempire or Cafe Blue Dream that, you know, uh, are not just doing, um, well, we've seen the growth of marijuana and cannabis as, as a business model, but these are um, CBD related stores. And we have the most amazing independently owned restaurants you can find from Crave to Sky High to Ovidia Artisan Chocolates. There's this really neat, the fantastic artisan chocolate shop that really all the chocolate is made on site but then um you can also go and grab a coffee and i have to say it's one of the best iced coffees you can get because they are not just using ice they're using now you've got my attention what's the name of it again ovidia artisan chocolates they literally they make their iced coffee with blocks of frozen coffee oh, so amazing. it's perfect um it does not get watered down it keeps you going all day but it's an artisan chocolate place as well so it's a great place if you're going to go uh if you need to get your very liberal 25 year old daughter um, gifts that she'd enjoy. That's a perfect place for a dad to get her daughter something. Um, you know, we have some neat restaurants for Sorante Molise, Fat Cats. We have several breweries. Brewery Sylvaticus is right downtown. I mean, Tom, all the places I'm naming too, you can come walk, come see me at the chamber office and then go visit all of those other places. I'm right next to Market Square Bakehouse. They've got these great wine whiskey barrel um, seats that they've now set up outside of their shop so you can come and enjoy um, the scenery while, you know, munching on lunch there or, you know, ordering one of their coffees. Their coffee is actually literally brewed right here in Amesbury, or I should say roasted um, by Ka Kaha Coffee Roasters. Um, they operate um, out of one of the old mill spaces here where they do the roasting here on site or here in Amesbury. And then, of course, you know, businesses like Market Square Bakehouse are selling their coffee. So if you really want to feel um, a Merrimack Valley vibe straight through, um, come and grab a coffee from Market Square and does and Ames come and visit me. You bring me a coffee, actually. I'll bring you a coffee for once. I'll bring one for you. Do, does Amesbury have tours? I know a lot of um, New England, especially Massachusetts communities, have tours because it's it, it's such so historical. Um, and I'm so wondering, if the, does the chamber do tours? Does somebody do two tours in Amesbury? So they do do um, an art, artist-themed tour that happens um, only um, in November. But we are in the process. We have one of our members is called the Amesbury Carriage Museum, and it's basically a historic um, – it's, it's an organization that's built around Amesbury's history. So Amesbury's industrial history is rooted in the development and the construction of carriages. And so they actually have been awarded several grants. They just broke ground, in fact, earlier this month. Actually, it may have even been at the end of last month. Um, where they're constructing um, right next to the amphitheater I talked about in this mill yard that's right in the center of our downtown. Um, they're constructing a historic um, museum where it's it's an awesome opportunity actually to come and learn a little bit about the history of, of Amesbury. I mean, again, you think that all these mill cities have the same history, but it's it's not the case. You know, the mills of Lawrence were developed to do some very different things than the mills in Haverhill. And the mills in Haverhill were doing very different things than the mills in Amesbury. And so... Um, if you're a history buff, especially a local history buff, um, come down here or go online and check out AmesburyCarriageMuseum.com. We get, um, we get, I get press releases from them all the time. I try to include it in my notebook when I have room for it. I think Amesbury is a cute little community. Um, I, I, I applaud you for taking on the task of being the uh, head of the Amesbury Chamber of Commerce and trying to promote uh, that cute little community. And I'd like to do this more. I know we talk a lot about politics on this show, but I think one of the things that we all learned from COVID is that it's important to help promote local businesses and local communities that are doing good stuff. And so I want to try and do uh, do that a little bit more. So I'm glad that you came on. Do you want to make a final pitch for uh, Amesbury, the Amesbury Chamber of Commerce and uh, the businesses that you represent? Hey, you guys have heard the pitch. I think it's come. If you want to be part of a pretty vibrant community of business owners that support each other in a really I think enthusiastic and genuinely um, affectionate way. You know, the businesses here like each other and want to support each other. And they're fortunate to be in a community where the people want to support them too. So if you want to join an organization that embodies and drives that spirit, you know, check us out. Call me at 508-423-6709 or check out our website, Kingsburychamber.com. Um, and thank you, Tom. This is weird. We just had a whole conversation. We didn't talk about any politics. I know. It's, it, well, and that this is what's funny is just because – Phil is liberal and I'm conservative and, and we don't agree on a lot of stuff. Sometimes he comes over to the office with a coffee and we chat about stuff and we never talk about politics. That's the way it should be. Uh, you know, Neil Perry and I don't agree on everything, but he still comes on the show and we talk about things. 
when I was growing up, that was just the way that it was. You disagreed with people. You didn't think of them as a bad person. You just disagreed with them. And I like that you also feel that way, even though you're kind of young and part of that whole millennial crowd. Well, I, you know what? A role like this showed me that there are plenty of people on both sides that really want to do right by their community. We're lucky. We have Diana DiZoglio and, and Jim Kelcourse up here. And, um, that's a bipartisan team. They busted their hump in yeah. such awesome ways to make sure that we we navigated this pandemic um, and are coming out on the other side still intact. So, Well, I want to make a pitch for the Valley Patriot if you guys have any advertising dollars, because even though we only have one location in Amesbury, you guys should be marketing yourself to the surrounding communities. And we do deliver to Haverhill and Georgetown and Groveland and Newburyport and Newberry and Salisbury. So we're all around uh, the Merrimack Valley. And I would think that those are the customers that you want to attract into your town. I got to start sending you re- yeah, press releases as well, too. That's a good point, Tom. Yeah. I didn't even think about where you were up in Amesbury. I always end up grabbing the newspaper outside of the, the Heavenly Donuts in North Andover, mm-hmm. which that same family owns the Heavenly Donuts up here in Amesbury, too. So it's the, Oh, no kidding. Maybe, well, you know what? Maybe we'll get a box outside the, uh, the Heavenly Donuts in Amesbury. We'll have two locations. And that'll help out a little bit, too. All right, thank, thank, so. thank you, Phil. Phil of the future, Phil DeCollegero. He's a member of the Board of Selectmen in North Andover, but he's also the head of the Amesbury Chamber of Commerce, and I wanted to have him come on to talk a little bit about the positive stuff that the chambers are doing to help local businesses get back on track. Thank, well, thank you, you, Phil. Thank you, Tom. Enjoy the rest of your day. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, we are nearing the end of the show. I want to thank our sponsors uh, let me just pull them up here because I don't want to forget anybody. Um, we we definitely appreciate the people. And we only lost one sponsor through all of COVID. And we've gained two sponsors. So we're up one. McLennan and Company, uh, Century 21. We want to thank Janet and we want to thank Matt and Sam and everybody over at McLennan. If you want to buy a house, this is the time to do it. This is the time when everybody else is worried and they're selling their house and they don't know what the real estate market's going to do. This is the time to go out and buy a house. And if you do, buy it from McLennan uh, Century 21 Real Estate. Climate Design Systems, give Nina a call down at Climate Designs. Uh, if you have an uh, HVAC issue that you want to take care of, they'll take care of you. A free plug to Joe Silverio and everybody at Four Star Lighting. He was on the show a couple of weeks ago. We're going to have, have him back in two weeks. Horizon Home Care. Uh, we love Janet Ferrillo. I'm sorry, uh, Karen Ferrillo uh, at Horizon Home Care. And they're real heroes because during this whole COVID thing, they were going into people's houses to take care of people one-on-one. And a lot of those people uh, were elderly or have autoimmune problems, and they were putting themselves at risk to do that. So we want to thank them. Our good friends at Borelli's Deli, where I'm going right after the show to get my, uh, to get my deli meats. I love uh, Don Smeriglio over at uh, Borelli's Deli. Uh, Marcin and Son Construction. I called Ronnie yesterday, and I said, hey, listen, we've been running your ad, but I haven't been billing you because of COVID, and I just want to know if you're still with us. If you're not, that's okay. He said, Tom, we're still in, and I love that. I love Ronnie Marcin, so we're going to try and get him on the show in the next month or so. Uh, AFC Urgent Care. Um, we want to thank Lisa Williams and her husband for all that they do. Uh, and a free shout out to Yella in Newburyport. We're going to be doing a, one of the things we've been doing every week, Ben, is we've been going out, finding one business that we can help. And then we get a, we put it online and we get about maybe 10 or 20 of us and we all go. And because of social distancing, we kind of have to break up into little groups. We did one for the North end of a car wash. We all went through and got our car wash, cars washed. Uh, last week we did Salvatore's on the deck in Lawrence and because we had more than six people, we had like six people here and six people over there, and six, but we all had a good time. And I think next week we're going to be hitting up to Yella in Newburyport. Um, we love Sarah Garul. She's, she's phenomenal. And she's a good friend of uh, Don Pease over at Don Scientech, who's always very supportive. Um, so that's, so that's it for our sponsors. One more thing I want to leave you with. We've got a minute left. Um, the Methuen City Council has been asking for the last couple of weeks, uh, for at least the last week or so, they want to know, especially Steve Saber, he wants City Council Saber, he's very concerned, very concerned, very concerned, that the police department in Methuen had barricades outside the police department during the Black Lives Matter protest in Lawrence. News flash to Steve Saber, who apparently doesn't really pay much attention to anything. The police department put barricades up because up until the night of the Lawrence protest for Black Lives Matter, every other Black Lives Matter protest resulted in destruction of property and attacks on police. 
And for this clown, Steve Saber, to get up there, by the way, you're not the mayor, Mr. Saber. You have no say as to how the police department operates, Mr. Saber, and Mr. McCarty, and Mr. Beauregard. You have no say over how the police department is run. That is done by the police chief and the mayor. You are not the mayor. And if the police chief made the decision to put barricades outside the police department because of the Black Lives Matter, and by the way, all the businesses up Broadway boarded up their windows, all the way up to the Rockingham Mall, which barricaded their doors because they were afraid that there was going to be violence. The Black Lives Matter people said when they held that protest, before that protest, that they were going to be starting in Lawrence and then marching up Broadway through Methuen into Salem. So everybody along that route that owned a business boarded up their business. And then you got clowns get up at that forum say, that's proof of racism. They thought we were going to do violence because we're minorities. No, they thought you were going to do violence because every single Black Lives Matter rally has turned into violence prior to that day. Kudos to the people of Lawrence who did not get involved in violence. They didn't attack any police officers except for one guy who got his ass kicked, and rightfully so. But the people of Lawrence didn't riot. And the fact that they didn't riot then doesn't make the people who expected a riot to be racist. Because a lot of those businesses, by the way, were Latino-owned businesses. So we wrap up the show today um, with, with just this one thing. And that's that the members of the Methuen City Council need to understand their role. They went to a forum that was run by the Inspector General. And the first thing the Inspector General said to them is, Know your role. You are city councilors. Your job is budget and policy. Your job is not to investigate a police officer that did wrongdoing. Your job is not to investigate why there were barricades outside the police department. Your job is not to investigate why a certain cop has a take-home car. Your job is to pass budgets and pass policies. And that's it. And if you overstep that role, you're micromanaging the executive. And you're not doing your job. So let's leave it at that. Let's roll up uh, Melvin Taylor. Next week, we've got Methuen Police Chief Joe Solomon here. That's going to be pretty contentious because I'm going after him on the All Lives Matter bullshit. It'll still be the safest show. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> it will still be the safest show. We will have Methuen Police Chief Joe Solomon will be here. Lawrence Police Chief Roy Vasco will be here. And North Andover Police Chief Chuck Gray will be here. Then the following week, we're going to have Methuen Mayor Neil Perry. Hopefully, he's feeling better. And Joe Silverio from Four Star Lighting. Your Valley Patriot is on the streets for June. The July edition will be out next Tuesday. Thank you, Ben Kitchen, my fine, fine producer. I appreciate you being here and uh, taking care of all that last-minute stuff with Joe, with uh, Phil DeCollegero. I want to thank Phil DeCollegero from the Amesby Chamber of Commerce and also a member of the Board of Selectmen in North Andover. Uh, our ratings, thanks for sending me the ratings yesterday. Our ratings are through the roof. So I want to just reiterate one more time. If you want to boycott the Paying Attention podcast or you want to boycott the Valley Patriot, please, please boycott us. Please. I'm begging you. Melvin Taylor says we got to go home. So go home already. <laughs>